<laughs> Call to order this meeting of the Sebastian City Planning and Zoning Commission, October 3rd, 2019. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call, please. Mr. Ross. Here. Ms. Cottenberg. Here. Mr. Carter. Present. Mr. Reyes. Here. Mr. Motti. Here. Mr. Kizilbosch. Here. Mr. Eugen. Here. And Mr. Alvarez. Here. Thank you. Okay. Next order of business is um, to approve the minutes of our previous two meetings. Um, we'll take them singly. You've all had the opportunity to review the minutes. Asking you for a motion rega uh, regarding our meeting of August 15th. Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion that we, <coughs> excuse me, accept the minutes of the meeting of August 15th, 2019. I'll second it, and I will commend Janet Graham for doing an excellent job on a trying meeting. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <coughs> Regarding the minutes of September 5th, 2019, we'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that the minutes of September 5th, 2019 be approved as submitted. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of September 15th, 2019. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Next order of business is a quasi-judicial public hearing. I'm going to open that hearing now and ask our attorney to read uh, the ordinance. Okay. Uh, just a correction. It's not quasi-judicial uh, because this will be a text amendment, so it's legislative, but we will be requiring a recommendation to go from this commission to the City Council. Um, so there will be an ordinance proposed to the City Council, and I'd like to read the caption of that ordinance for the record. Um, it will be going as Ordinance 19-07, an ordinance of the City of Sebastian, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances, Chapter 86, Article 3, by establishing a definition for recyclable materials and amending the Land Development Code, Article 22, Language and Definition, by establishing definitions and land use classifications for recycling or material recovery facilities, and amending Article 5, zoning district regulations by establishing recycling or materials recovery facilities as conditional uses in the industrial zoning district and amending Article 6 conditional use criteria by establishing specific conditions for recycling or materials recovery facilities, providing for repeal of conflicting provisions, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for Scrivener's errors, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Have any of the commissioners had any ex parte communications with the applicant? Okay. Madam Chairman? Yes. When he read the, the ordinance, he mentioned the definition for recyclable materials, or re, is the recycling materials from the very first part? Mm -hmm. Are we establishing what are the recyclable materials with this amendment? <coughs> or are we just... I'm sorry, if I may, Mr. Reyes, I'm sorry. Um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is a definite, there's your code of ordinances and then your land development code. So there's two different 
codes that we deal with, correct? And the code of ordinance, you are establishing a definition for recyclable materials. Okay, okay. that reads different on our, on our agenda. It says establishing a definition for recycling material. Um, and he said recyclable. And he said recyclable. Oh, the first page. If I'm that's establishing okay. a definition for recyclable, that's the types of materials. Is that not correct? That is correct. Yes, okay, sir. That you. was a. That's a just a typo on your cover page. But if you look at the uh, the ordinance itself, the ordinance language, and the, the notice the notice in the newspaper, it'll say recyclable materials. So I do apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could we hear from our applicant, or is that not? Well, if you wouldn't mind, Madam Chair, let me um, start, if you don't mind. So um, in the, the Community Development Department staff received um, a, a pre-application, if you will, uh, from Warrior Salvage and and Recyclable Materials. It's, it's kind of changed names as we've gone along. However, what we gather from what they're going to propose in the future, the use that they'd like is to recycle materials. Uh, in looking in our codes, our code of ordinances and our land development codes, we don't address the recycling industry. And we felt that that was something that we would want to bring to the community for your consideration. It's a green industry. Um, Perhaps it's something we'd want to add and establish in our community. Now we prohibit junkyards and salvage yards. So that is prohibited in your code of ordinances and in your um, uh, comprehensive plan. And I believe that's all been explained to you and provided to you uh, in your materials. So we felt that it was important to redefine the recyclable materials within our code of ordinances and then move on to the land development code to define where uh, recycling centers, material centers uh, would be established and what conditions we would want to place on any future development of such um, industry in our community. So that is why it's before you this evening. And um, the applicant is here. Uh, they asked that we, we recommended that this isn't even in our code. So if you want to move forward with any type of site plan improvement for the property, we would have to amend the code. And that is their first initial step uh, in this process. And the applicant is here to present to you if you so desire, but um, I think it's it's fairly straightforward in what we've presented. Thank you. Could I ask just a general question at this point about the, the ordinance that we received, and that is, this is in existence, the uh, information we see typed in kind of a dark red, that is the modification? That is correct, sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, may we hear from our applicant, please? <laughs> Hi there, good evening. Uh, Rebecca Grohl Hall for the record. So, G R O H A L L. All right, you're welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight and talk to you a little bit about the importance of recycled materials in today's construction industry. Uh, currently, the construction industry utilizes for both home building and commercial sites products that range anywhere from 50 to 90 percent recycled materials. Um, and just out of curiosity, how many of you recycle at home either glass, paper, plastic, metals? Everybody. Well, All right. Um, and have any of you recently had a home remodeling project where perhaps you replaced windows, took down your gutters, anything involving metal? Um, so that's a pretty common replacement. Lots of people like to do window replacements, for example. They do have a definite lifespan. Um, and what happens to those windows once they've been taken out of your house is where it becomes a critical step. Typically, those materials contain metal, and they're taken to a recycling facility. 
Uh, currently, the City of Sebastian's Code does not address recycling facilities at all, so there's none locally here for that market. The county, though, has goals to reduce the amount of recyclable materials in the landfills and to extend the life of the landfill. And this is a good thing in everybody's, to everybody's benefit to extend the life of our landfill. Uh, one of those ways they can achieve those goals is through recycling and more importantly, through recycling facilities that focus on metal. Recycling facilities themselves simply gather the materials and bundle them to be sold to a facility where they're refabricated into products. So it's important to note that the recycling facilities serve as a drop-off point. The materials come in in an enclosed facility, which we'll talk about at the site plan step, and they're bundled into like types of metals and like types of products. Recycling facilities themselves don't smelt metal, they don't burn it, they don't refabricate it into anything else. They simply bundle it and send it off site. And that's a big difference between them and a salvage yard. In a salvage yard, typically you get materials that are stockpiled for months, <coughs> years, sometimes even decades. In recycling, they want to get those products in and get them turned around and get them back out the door. So this provides a service to the local construction industry, as well as the weekend warrior who might be a do-it-yourself homeowner. So I appreciate staff's assistance on this project, and I ask that you vote in favor of this amendment. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I've done a number of these projects, so I know a lot about the Mel's Recycling Facility, and the project owner is here tonight, as well as his son. Open it for questions. Typically, it's sorted and then bundled. Um, I don't know if I want to call the applicant up, perhaps. You want to answer this? And I'll step aside. You can introduce yourself. Hello, folks. How are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm Shannon Cook. Um, the answer to your question is, as it comes in, there is typically scale set up. Like, for instance, if it's steel, like if you have a piece of what's ferrous, what's called ferrous metals, then it would go over a scale on the truck itself. It would drive right over and it gets unloaded. Okay, that's, and it goes, gets weighed again, and you get paid for that amount of money for the steel. Now, that's one scale is dedicated for that. Then you typically have, most places, one to two other small scales, just you know, five foot on the ground scales. For instance, so when somebody comes into the yard, for instance, they'd pull their pickup truck up, they would pull off, five pieces of aluminum, I'd weigh five pieces of aluminum. <coughs> that piece of aluminum would go into a container for shipment right then. You go take it and you put it in the container, it's ready for shipment. Then they would bring out 10 pounds of copper, I'd put 10 pounds of copper on the scale, and then I would take that 10 pounds and put it in the container, and so forth, so forth with all types of metal, you know, wire, uh, aluminum cans, um, just like I said, ferrous metals, brass, uh, a lot of the stuff I do is like air conditioning, old air conditioners, stuff like that. You know, they get brought in. We, we put those out. Um, uh, I work, you know, I, I have owned a facility before. And in most cases, I end up getting um, local municipalities like you guys, you know, get the scrap from you guys, all your plumbing, you know, your brass fittings. And I had the city of Vero Beach and the counties for a very long time, you know, so... Things like that, you look, you know, you actually look to put back into the market. Is, is it just like private people bringing things, or do you have, is there commercial uh, stuff coming in from commercial places? Well, what happens there is it's mostly private people because in, in the scrap facility world, let's say, a, uh, for instance, a plumbing company, most of the time that's the guy's lunch money. The guy's got, you know, 20 pounds of copper he saves up over a week. He's going to end up getting 40 bucks at the end of the week. You know, some accounts, if I do have commercial accounts, most of the time what I do is I'll set a, I'll set a preset box at their place. They'd fill it up. They'd call me. i just go pick it up and put it on my truck when I ship it. You know, just to, that's how I usually do commercial accounts. And don't we already have a recycling place at the county dump? In our city. No, it, it, that is a... That is not what the one is out there, no. There's no pay facility out there. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. 
Yeah, I have. Where's this going to be at? 7701, 130th? It is the strangest piece of property in Sebastian. Um, it's the only piece. It's it's 360 degrees, basically covered in uh, Indian River County around it. It's the only piece. It's all by itself. That's, that's uh, irrelevant. It's irrelevant to what we're actually discussing. It's right across the street. Oh, what do you mean? You want to know where it's at? Yeah, you Madam know where the is? Madam um, Chair. On the yeah, we're we're on site plan. Uh, transfer station on 130th there in Roseland. Oh, Roseland. Okay. Yeah, it's right across the street. Roseland okay. over okay. the tracks. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I could, okay. just one moment. Okay. Now I know what's yep. you're, you're considering a recommendation for a text change to our code, however. This is not a site-specific, like a variance or a special exception you're approving, so it's not just <laughs> theirs. You're looking at a text amendment, so it yeah. could okay. come up in That's other important. places that, that meet the requirements of what the new language will be. So just, just remember that it's not site-specific. What okay. you're doing tonight. Thank so, you for that clarification. Can I ask a question on that point? Uh, in our packet, there was uh, a, several pages included um, a development order application for Red Warrior Holding Corporation. Is that included as part of this, or is it separate? Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Roth. <laughs> um, it was included because the applicant paid for us to consider a text amendment. And so that application is showing that this is for a text amendment okay. to include recycling, recycling materials. Yeah. Okay. That's why I thought it was odd that he was presenting to us. So well, it, it's his request because it ties into if he's going to proceed further with the site plan, if we're not going to allow this use in the, in the community, then there's no need to submit the site plan. So they have submitted for our consideration of the text amendment. Does that make sense? For, for clarification, this is text amendment only. He will come back to the planning board for approval under a special use, am I correct? Absolutely, he would have to bring a whole site plan under the conditional okay. uses that you, you, I think that's the clarity condition. that everybody needed. I'm sorry, <laughs> that the conditional. Uh, that was clear. Okay. Conditional whatever standards that you all set in accordance with this text amendment. But the application is only for a text amendment. Okay, clear. And it, and it would question. apply to other pieces of property in the city, so just be aware of that. Other light industrial. Well, yes. Correct. So we're asking for this text amendment in the light industrial zone classification. Light industrial. The scrap facility is, it's not like a junkyard, it's not like a scrap, uh, you know, where, just like she said, you know, you have garbage laying everywhere, stuff like that. So we put everything in containers, because if we do it twice, then it's a pain in the neck. You know, we do have a steel pile and stuff like that, but it's it's nothing sits on site for time. Just like she said, it comes in, it goes out. You hold it too long, we're looking at, you know, potentially losing money. Could make more money, but I don't know, playing, <coughs> playing the game. It's based on the metal market. May, may we ask him questions? Um, so typically I, I have seen these, I recycle. I love bringing my scrap windows or stuff. I'll pick up trash if I see a piece of metal that I feel is worth something. Um, but I've gone to a lot of these places and that scrap, your washing machines, your air conditioner, sits on site for a little while while your guys are dismantling it to put them in the containers before it gets crushed and cubed to send off by semis. Besides that, I see a lot of traffic where it backs up, especially during storm season where there's a lot of awnings that flew away and all the scrappers are out. Hialeah on scrap, you know, when people put out bulk, there's tons of scrappers out there and they just becomes a nightmare on some of these small sites, if I may. Um, so I understand everybody wanting to ask where your site is. Uh, now that you allowed us to ask some questions. So, and then I see a lot of uh, hazardous waste from batteries, uh, oil from lawnmower equipment, jet skis, and stuff like that that gets spread around the site, making the site uh, a hazardous site for later on, if you leave this site because your business is not good, to sell the site. 
So it's for me, I love recycling, but I love my city. So we have a site here that's possibly not in our city, and it's a mess also. So I'm just letting you know where I'm at with that. Uh, I, I, I heard that it was going to be all interior building. Now there is papers and other recyclable materials, but when you were explaining your business, you started with most of it, the bulk metals and stuff. And most of it is glass, so, yeah. That's now. Thank I you. mean, to to I'm glad you actually brought the subject up. I mean, it's it's great. Um, I can clarify a few things. Um, for one is the one thing you say about a, a size of the facility. I agree with you on that. You know, I agree that, you know, you should have acres, not not a quarter acre lot, not a garage door you can slide up and down and make people go down the road for two miles. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, my facility is five acres plus. You know, um, I did that for a reason. You know, we had to spend a bunch of money to get that because of that rather than starting in a small place because we can handle that. You know, we can get people in if we have to. We can get them off the roads. The... Um, as far as the facilities go, our facility is going to be set up very, very green. I've owned another yard before, and you know, I had people coming from the state to show my facilities to other facilities, you know, to how to run it. I don't believe in any EPA or DEP, any other problems. They come in the yards constantly check, and I invite them in because I want to become what's called a green yard, mm -hmm. and Sebastian would be leading the leading the state in that because I'm going to be a green yard. And the reason being is because I'm starting it. And I can, all I got to do is start it as a green yard and keep it as a green yard. The, um, your question about the oils, the gasolines, anything like that, the batteries, it's all done in the inside. Everything, every, anything that comes in at the oils like gets drained. There's no fluids allowed on the site. Anything that's got a fluid in it, it gets rejected and it doesn't get bought. The, um, anything that we do buy it has a fluid in it, you know, that we buy because it has like you said, a lot more the wells get drained. That's a requirement. <coughs> uh, we, we do it in, inside. <coughs> we put them in preset containers. And the best thing about it, we recycle them. We get paid for those too. So it's to our benefit to recycle, recover everything we can. You know, um, <coughs> and that's the kind of cool thing about the business is you don't have just one thing to make money on. You can make money on everything that you can get in that's fits you know so just like I said instead of making it a, a problem with the oils we made it a profit and in the area I mean there's really no way for it to pollute I mean because we're, we're completely draining everything we're putting in well, direct that'll facilities. be some other questions I'm gonna ask about our building code how will that be handled on those type of uh, sites so uh, that'll be asked later on. Yeah, I guess, it, when and we already, and we've been working on this for a couple of years now, and we've been, we're very, very deep invested. Um, and it's it's to the point where we're just trying to detail everything for you guys. We got it all on paper. We had we've we've had it here submitted, you know, uh, for quite a while. It's going to be a very clean, clean facility. I mean, there's just no other way of putting it. Well, and thank you for that. I invite. And I'll tell you, shit, I'll invite inspections. I don't care. It doesn't, I mean, it, because if I got to do it, everybody's got to do it. So it makes the facilities work to me. I believe in keeping things right. You know, nothing's going to be stored where it shouldn't be stored. And in my yard before, I was working with the state to become a green yard. I had bought a, a junkyard in Vero Beach. And it was a junkyard for a very long time. It was a junkyard since the 50s. <coughs> And I was working with the state of Florida to bring it to a green yard facility, and which means I had to do a lot of stuff because, you know, there was no nothings back in the 50s or whatever. They, you know, hell, I was finding cars buried back there and stuff, you know. But we got it to the point of the green yard blessing, and I sold it right at that point right there. And that's where I want to make that status here in Sebastian. And if I could just interject, you just touched on this. You work together with DEP I work on with your every, site, every department. and you're held to every state and federal standard for sure for clean environment and the disposal of liquids and petroleums and all the products that might harm the environment. So this actually is a better option than letting people toss their 
use motor oil into like your, the regular trash or the people who just, you know, stick it down the drain and we know that happens. Um, this gives them an option and a place to come to a facility where it can be properly disposed of. And, and one more point is anything that gets on my property, it's less money for me because I have to fix it. You know, I have to deal with it. Um, the product it didn't go in the container it's supposed to go in. You know, it just doesn't happen. It, it comes with fines. They come in, they see the wrong things. You know, you can't let stuff sit out that, you, know, you can bucket oil sit never leaking on the ground. You can't do that kind of stuff. And that's, and that's very restricted. That's very watched, you know. And we, like again, we're not what you see when you go to Vero Beach. When you go to Vero Beach on 40 Fishery, which I'm sure you've been there because you said you recycled, um, it's a mess. I don't like you, but they're junkyards, they're scrapyards. They're, they're, full-on salvage yards. They take in things, it doesn't matter what it is, they'll take in a fiberglass, whatever, if it's got a piece of brass and they rip it to pieces and leave giant trash piles. You know, that's not what we are. We take in the product that we sell and that's it. We don't take any of the extra stuff. You know, our, our outgoing garbage, we have a dumpster. <laughs> that's it, we have a dumpster because we don't take it, we don't buy it. It has to be cleaned when it comes in. It's got to be a, a product that is sellable. It's got to be brass, it's got to be copper. If it's, let's say we call it dirty aluminum, that means it's got a screw in it, a steel screw, which you said you don't want to so you know that. So that's how clean we actually make it be. It can't have big plastic hanging off it, it can't have all this stuff because we don't want to send it out the gate. I got a question. What kind of uh, machinery will be you using? The only machines that we really use is a forklift to carry the containers to load the trucks. We use a small, smaller front end loader to keep the steel pile contained and small. And we use a, what you would call, you see on a clearing lot uh, excavator. It's basically an excavator with a hand on it. And what we do is we pick the materials up, put it in a dump trailer, and we send it out. And we do it every day. We just, one truck a day. They cover, I don't care how busy the yard is, usually one truck a day will cover it because that's a lot of materials in one truck. Okay. You know, Thank so you. It, there's not a lot of traffic when it comes to any commercial traffic really. There's, I mean, as far as, you know, people coming to the yard in a hurricane situation, I agree it may be a lot of people, but at least they got a place to take the stuff, you know. And it doesn't last for long. I mean, it's well, that'll be, you know, this is kind of a local thing we're creating, and I know it'll be all coming in from everywhere when that kind of stuff happens. My, my, uh, <laughs> my. There's a lot of traffic. I agree with you on the size of lots, though, on the scrapyard. I mean, that's maybe something you want to look at. You know, I absolutely agree with you that I don't think it should be on half acres, which I think is in it. You know, I don't think it should be on one acre. I think it should be on a bigger piece of property. You know, I won't disagree with your thinking on that because it just, it gives you the room to do what you have to do without making <coughs> big piles, without doing anything, you know, that's wrong. You can't, it's, you gotta use the right size sock, is what I'm saying. If you're gonna do the, if you're gonna do the business right, you gotta have a place to process. You gotta have a place to put your metals. You gotta have a place to have your trucks. I mean, it's, you, and you, you gotta have a place for people to come through. You know, so that's the reason we went and spent and did what we did to buy the proper facility. And we pretty much took it out of Sebastian. I mean, it's, it's in. If you could see the way it's zoned in the county, I mean, it is the only piece of Sebastian. That's it. There's one little stem that stems out, and it's surrounded by county. Matter of fact, in the future, I would probably like try to annex some property to it. The interesting point with that, though, is the county allows by administrative permit recycling facilities. Mm -hmm. The city's code doesn't address them at all. So we're simply asking for <coughs> Are you subject to inspections by EPA or any of those other Everybody. Entities? Everybody. And it can be, here's a, here's a thing about that, and I'm not afraid to say it. You know, I, I come to you in the truth here. I'm a member of your community. I've lived here my whole life. I love this place. 
Uh, I have other businesses here now. Um, my sons are going to be my partners. And as far as everything goes in this site, it's going to be professional. And it's going to be something to be proud of. Sebastian can brag about it. And it's not going to be something that, you know, it's going to be a hinder on you. You know, I'm, I'm known in the community, you know, I, I believe in doing things right 100%. I don't, I invite, if you, the way the, like the DEP or EPA or any of them work, and they even have local uh, departments here in the county too as well that you can call. Environmental Protection right down here in uh, Vero Beach, you can call. He's worked with me a lot. If you have any concerns, all you have to do is pick the phone up. He'll be there that day. He'll come that day. You can come, Mr. Flusher used to come through my yard all the time, county commissioner up there in my other yard and check on because he actually helped push my, my other one going through do some adjustments I wanted to do. And he used to come through and check it all the time. He'd walk through it and see it, make sure I was doing the receipts right, He'd make sure I was doing the, I mean, he was just hands on and made sure that things were done right. But it worked because my yard was like a shining globe out there compared to the other ones. You know, and that's what I'm going to do here. We're going to make it right. Mr. Ross. I have a couple of questions of, uh, about the ordinance itself, just to make sure it's clear. Um, this is of the staff. Um, on page two, um, article three, item C, um, it says it specifically prohibits junk as defined in and it goes on to say, household appliances, scrap metals, tanks, casks, cans, barrels, boxes, drums, piping. Um, and it's pretty explicit, but when you look over, it says it prohibits it, but when you look over at page three, uh, item two, again in the red, it said, no material shall be buried uh, burned on site, no tires or hazardous materials shall be stockpiled on site. And it's kind of a conflict because one says you can't do it, and then uh, item C says you can't do it, and then item two in the next page says it can't be stockpiled on the site, which indicates that it could be on the site at some point in time. It's just a, if a I may, concern. Madam Chair, may yeah. I? I'll, I'll take that if you all want to step in. Thanks. What I, I really want to make very, very clear is that in our comprehensive plan and in our code of ordinances, it expressly prohibits junk and salvage yards. So this is a serious consideration for you all. It, it expressly prohibits it. And if you read in your future land use element of the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> Heavy metal fabrication, batch plants, salvage yards, chemical or petroleum manufacturing, or refining, rubber or plastics manufacturing, or other use generating potentially harmful environmental or nuisance impacts shall be prohibited. These uses typically generate heavy tr truck traffic, require significant acreage, are difficult to screen and buffer from <coughs> residential areas, and therefore shall be located in more sparsely developed unincorporated areas. So this, these types of uses are expressly prohibited in the city of Sebastian for the very reasons that I just read to you. Now when you look at the definition of junk, which I provided to you all in section one, it is defining everything that means junk to this ordinance. Can it mean other things? Possibly, you know, it, it, I'm, not everything's included. <laughs> Windows aren't included, for one thing. Um, so when we redefined recyclable materials, we, we wanted to recognize that definition of junk and make allowances for other items. And Mr. Roth, I would like to commend you in recognizing <clears throat> this definition and drawing your eyes to it because it does not include the building materials that have been mentioned by the applicant. So building materials such as old 
windows or other scrap metals you would find in a, a building site are, are not part of recyclable materials. That may be something we want to consider. Liquids are not, are, it's silent on liquids, <coughs> Mr. Roth, for this definition. Now, when you go to conditional use criteria, item two, as you pointed out, that's for um, the purpose that we are not allowing anything to be stockpiled on site unless outside storage is approved by you all and secondary containment is provided. And by secondary containment, I mean concrete pads, drains to collect <coughs> liquids. We have been told by this applicant that this isn't, there's not going to be any hazardous materials on site. But again, if you'd like to expressly prohibit that, because this is not the only site, it would not be the only site possibly in the future. You always have to, to look broader. Um, so that is, that's a, that's a good thought to bring in to play now. <coughs> And also, I believe we could, you may want to look at the minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet, which is only really a half an acre, perhaps isn't large enough. Mr. Reyes, you were, you were bringing that up. Perhaps we do want to increase right. the acreage there. So Hello. these are really great thoughts that you all may want to consider in, in these conditions. Yeah, because they're supposed to go around. But, um, or, you know, you may not want to recommend this in our city at all. I mean, it's, it's really all up to you. Thank you for the input. Mm -mm. Yeah. The definition of junk is exactly what it is. It's something that gets thrown away, right? You know, um, junk is something that goes to the landfill. You know, scrap material is what everything in our world is built out of. You know, so one thing that there's really no defining the word junk, because I'm not going to have junk in my yard. I'm going to have recyclable materials, which it says <coughs> in, in another part of the, uh, the amendment. It's going to be recyclable materials. And I did agree that I wouldn't stockpile materials, which means I won't have 10 piles of materials. I'll keep this one small pile of material and I will load it and get it out of there because I don't want to stockpile materials. It's a volatile market. You can't do it. You'll lose your butt and you'll, you won't be in business long. You have to roll the materials. The difference between junk is a gentleman will take an old sailboat. He'll set it in the yard. He'll sell everything he can off of that thing and leave it sit there, the old fiberglass junk that should be in the landfill. He'll sit there and then he doesn't want to pay to get rid of it, so he's going to leave it sit there and just collect piles of junk. In my business, I take the materials that I need to sell to keep money in the bank to buy tomorrow. You know, so when we buy something, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, something that has to roll. You can't let it sit. If you do let it sit, it doesn't work. It's a necessity to keep your business it's going. It's a very big necessity. If you don't roll the materials, you don't move it, everything is contained pretty good. I mean, it's <coughs> it's, a, it's a neat facility. That I, I do have it on paper, you know. I think that the city would be proud of what we're planning on doing, and I think you'll see the city of Sebastian <laughs> in recycling magazines as a, as a example. Thank you, folks. Thank you. <coughs> Happy. Ready to vote? No. Hey. No. I have no questions. Okay. We'll, I, go, back. go ahead. I have one more okay. question. Um, it's almost like we needed to create a chapter for recyclable materials. Because <laughs> uh, why didn't we just strike through and junk? the items that we're adding, adding to recyclable materials instead of saying, except as defined in A, 
Any other, any other kind of common household items? This is like open for, I'm just stating some of my comments. And, well, uh, and Mr. Mr. I mean, this is these are Mr. great Reyes. comments, really, Mr. Reyes. But what we have to do because of the different We're writing the language codes, for this now. It's under solid waste. Okay, it's Chapter 86 under solid waste. Okay. So we have to address it under the Code of Ordinances addressing solid waste. So that's why recyclable materials were placed there. And you know we're not going to have a, a whole new chapter, but it's considered solid waste. Um, again, you know we can add building material if you all are comfortable with that. I know that we are under the definition under the Land Development Code. We have, you know, said that uh, non-hazardous waste streams. So we are probably pretty covered there. I want you all to know that when you're a planner and you're writing code, <laughs> you s steal from other <laughs> municipalities and local governments, which is always really great because you look at what other people are doing, mm -hmm. you see if their verbiage or their uses fit what you know your community might need or might want to consider. So, I mean, of course, that's what we do also. And so a lot of this verbiage comes from, well, a lot of it is from Indian River County, but um, some is from other areas and definitions in okay. the industry. So I, I want you to feel comfortable with that. These, okay. you know, that's, where, that's how we come up with these things. Another couple other questions. On the next page three, when we mention uh, separating and sorting recyclable materials from a non-hazardous waste stream, that, so there was never going to be hazardous waste stream on site. That's it. That's exactly what I was just sta stating. That on the same we're probably page, okay. The conditional use within the following zoning. So we're only saying an industrial. It's industrial light within industrial. We don't have industrial light zoning. Okay. We just have industrial. I heard the applicant say industrial light. Uh, um, so yes, it would be industrial I, zoning. And of course, the 20,000 square feet, you already know my, my comment well, what on would, that. What that's, would be your pleasure? a small lot. Okay, what would be your pleasure? Greater than an acre, five acres? I don't acres. think with the code that you're writing, the separation from the adjoiners and stuff, that he's going to be able to fit anything to do anything on a 20,000 square foot lot. Okay. So uh -oh. there's a lot of uh, side yard setbacks and stuff. Uh, I think a facility like this is going to have to have a lot of uh, the drainage. We don't want it getting into our into our groundwater at all or ground. So um, I didn't read the code because I didn't think the applicant was going to be here talking about it. Uh, but I will follow up and look into what our building codes are for that kind of facility. So I'm sure we'll be on top of that once it's submitted. But so, what would be your recommendation then from this commission? Should we move forward as to the prop the, the, the larger size lot for sure? Uh, definitely only an industrial. Uh, can I just put in there that a drive-through restaurant requires two acres? So would we want to say five acre minimum? That would be my feeling because it's compatible with what I heard mentioned earlier and it wouldn't be a hardship and I think that is 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 acceptable. Now, I can't do the is quick math to figure out the square the, you know, how frontage and depth because you say a a, a square well you didn't say something, you said minimum lot size. Correct. Um, and there probably should be, based on what Mr. Reyes said, a uh, minimum width and minimum depth so that there's adequate drainage or, or takeoff for drainage away from it. Even though it's not going to be hazardous there, you get the rain coming down and if there's anything that happens to be sitting out overnight for whatever reason, it could run off. It says it's within an enclosed structure, but um, you know yeah, things like that do happen. So I, I would prefer uh, if Mr. Reyes is agreeable to make it a, a square lot. I, I'm just, I, this I is for everybody. No, I don't think that's necessary. It's just open discussion yeah. right now, is it not? 
Yeah. I'm not making an, a, a vote on anything. So. <laughs> I, I don't think that it needs to be a square or a rectangle or a figure eight. I think that the no, no. When I was talking setbacks. about no. setbacks, yeah, the setbacks I was, take care yeah, of that. Yeah, it's totally different. Yeah. Well, I want to mention too in that case that it mentions um, 50 feet to any property line abutting a residential district. And that's where I see a little red flag because it says residential district. Um, I'm just looking. I played a lot of baseball. From here to that wall is from here to the pitcher's mound, and that's 60 feet. And from here to that wall is closer to 100 well, the, or 80. So, I mean. The I just, lot size, uh, just prior to your <laughs> lot size code here, you mentioned that a secondary containment area may be provided off-site or something like that, or on-site? On-site, so, outside, <laughs> Definitely, yes. it would definitely have to be a much larger site mm -hmm. uh, if you're gonna be doing that kind of stuff. So uh, 20,000 square feet, I'm curious of what city had that, because- That was actually from Indian River County. That's where we need County. to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's Indian River County. I probably should have looked elsewhere. Hmm. Um, I, I think that the it's all conditional your, use anyway. Yeah. So I think your concern about 50 feet from a residential, abutting residential, is while valid. Um, There's some if you're in an industrial location, chances are there is a residential abutting all our industrial right now. There is, and that that's my concern. It wouldn't well, be all the way. We're, you know, I, I if we're creating new industrials in the uh, annex area, mm -hmm. you know, we want. I we want to make this right. I, yeah, I, we do, and thank you for that. I, right. I am, because I, I guess I have some soft feelings for private property rights. If a person, uh, industrial sites don't just pop up here and there and everywhere. They're part of the map before you build. You look at what surrounds you. If you, and you do, people do recognize, oh, if I'm going to build my home closer to an industrial site, the land cost is a lot lower. So don't cry about it later. That's just the way I feel about it. It's like, if you're going to build a house next to an airport, I don't want to hear you talking about the airplanes are too loud. Um, if you build next to a chicken ranch, I don't want to hear you talking about the smell of the chickens. <laughs> but if the residence is there and this is approved later not that's approved the, the industrial industrial zoning is there it. already this would just be one of the additional uses and frankly many of the other uh, industrial uses might also be odious did you like that word yeah mm -hmm. I, I and that's just that's where I come from. I, I feel real strongly though that I remember you can't do this on a you can't do this on a half acre. We spent a lot of time on this code writing these codes and there was a discussion prior when we wrote this about junkyards and salvage yards and recyclable places. Although it's recyclable they didn't even get in there. But I think the thought was salvage yards. So. I, I think that I, I can remember about thirty five years ago I had a friend who uh, started a brand new business in Chicago, recycling concrete. 35 years ago. Prior to that, nobody recycled concrete. Every road now that is built is built with recycled concrete. So it's, recycling is kind of a moving target Correct. As we, as we progress. And I think it is wise, if we're going to have it at all, to discuss what it might be and where it might be located and that's probably all I have to say. But I wouldn't count on it. Ms. Frazier, you in here you say minimum lot size of twenty thousand square feet. How large is the applicant slot? It is about five acres. Five acres? Yes, sir. So there's ample room. Well I, I would assume. We're we're not not considering that, but for this one, yes, possibly. But I do want to, for in your industrial zoning, um, minimum lot size is 15,000 square feet, and that's for all industrial type of zoning. And you have minimum setbacks 
Um, in fact, it, it does state in there that no building or structure in an industrial district shall be located closer than 30 feet to a residential district. So we are establishing these things in here. I am more than comfortable of, uh, uh, you know, making things. I'm comfortable with five acres. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I think it should be, it should, that five acres too much, it should be, I mean, two acres. That's, that's reasonable, yeah. You're saying five two acres, acres. Not But his, his, his site is five acres. Yeah, his okay. site we're is not, okay. We're not talking about one site. We're not talking, we're talking about one about site. Any yes. site. We're not talking about one site. In the future? In, in, in the our future. I mean, changes, we should have a two acres minimum. Uh, minimum. Yeah. With a two acre, they could have a hundred feet uh, setback from the residential area. Yeah, that could do it. Yeah. Oh, is that what you're you're yeah, suggesting? That's what we do it. Yeah. Do a, move it to a hundred feet, feet setback from residential property, yeah, for yeah. the building. This yeah, is. for the building. Yeah. I gotcha. Okay. You know that a, a two acre square is 408 by 400, excuse me, 416 by 416. Yeah. You take 100 feet off each side, you don't have much left. No, for residential, abutting the residential. It right. won't be abutting all around. It's just right. on one side. Yeah. And it's only for the building? Yeah. It's only for the building. So in that 100 feet. From the residential. Okay. Correct. In that 100 feet, you could have a stormwater pond. <coughs> yeah. You could have yeah. a drive aisle. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? So. It, it, I'm just trying to put it into context for you. Yeah. I have no vote here, so you all tell me what you desire. Yeah, there, yeah but you might have you might have uh, residential on two sides of a, of a commercial piece of property, or maybe three sides of a commercial piece of property. So now your your 100 feet or whatever is is your yeah, lot's but pretty we small. We talk about industrial area. How many industrial zoning? Budding all right. these have, yeah, so. We don't yeah. have any. That yeah, most of our industrial zoning, for your information, are yeah. at, at the airport, yeah. um, south of 512, yeah. uh, by Old Dixie, and um, this odd one out in, <laughs> in the Roseland Road uh, area there. Um, I can't think of another one. That's it, yeah. That's it. So we don't have very much. Yeah. yeah. I think it's going to be a benefit to the community. Yeah. Any more questions? So we're kind of going by the NAICS standards for what recycling materials are. That is correct, sir, yes. Okay. I have no questions. Nobody else? No, no for, questions? Just, just for the record, I quickly figured it out. It's um, 87,120 square feet if it were two acres. Wait, say that again? Where'd you come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> four, 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 three, five, six, <laughs> oh, times two. Okay. Yeah. We're good. That's the surveyor. <laughs> well, you didn't volunteer it. I brought it up. <laughs> Since well, it was for, mentioned as 20,000. If, if I may ask the commission, when, when you make a motion, if you would please address some of the issues that we have discussed because these would be changes that we would make prior to going to the <coughs> city council. And those changes would address uh, the setback from residential, uh, minimum lot size, and um, any additions to um, the definition for recyclable materials, if you so choose. On the, the screening of the sites. Um, Thank you. It's a, by the NICS standards, it's an eight foot Screening, say a wall. Um, I went to a meeting today, and one of the yards is stacking above the wall, where it's very visible from the adjoiners. We have a, a height restriction on his containers that he will be keeping on site before he ships it off. That so you don't stack them above the screening. No. I'm. Yes, sir. No. So some of the dumpsters are what, they 10 feet high, 8 feet high maybe? Well, that's, um, basically the highest thing is the semi, mm -hmm. the, okay. the back of the truck, it's uh, 13 foot. I'm trying to write our code so you can't stack your containers on a corner on your site until it gets picked up. Oh, this, 
I'm, I'm looking at everything. I've, I've seen many of these sites, and they're they're horrible. So if All we're right. writing this code, I'm just curious. Yeah, that's is this fine. something like I, I can add in there? Give you a good number to go by. Now the truck. I mean, the truck. I have its own parking place, but uh, that truck's in and out only. So one, I'm not yeah, gonna, one day, one time a day, be in there. And yeah. Out, but, so uh, it's not permanent. It's 13 on foot, and that's basically how high you'll see some at times. I'll put 13 foot. I'll put the the stuff in the truck. But you gotta remember when you're in an eight foot fence here, if it's right next to the fence, you'll see it at 13 foot. But if you're eight foot here and you're over here at 13, you won't see it. Because the, the depth of the fence, the height of the fence, your closeness will affect that. I, I understand all that. There's, there's, there's a little confusion here. Um, is you're my question confusing, Ms. Fraser? You're referring to the height of the truck with the dumpster. No. Now no. we're referring to just the dumpster. No. The dumpster that he's. He in separates material. He's put copper in one dumpster. The maximum height of Aluminum that maybe in another one. No? My, all my non-ferrous metals will be inside. I've got everything inside my building. The only thing I'm putting outside is ferrous In dumpsters, containers. The only thing I'm going to put in, in, in containers, like my, for instance, my truck. Well, actually, it's I'll, probably not a question for you anyways, because this is going to go for any applicant. For you, right, right. Yeah. So this you're is the right. way I'm looking at it. I just want to put my part in because you know you do the I, I appreciate made. that. I'm so glad you came because we've learned a lot from what you've there, told us. decisions being made, stuff you know on, on the two-acre thing too as well. I'd like to throw one more thing in that. There's water retention required in that. You know, mm -hmm. so so you take that out of that 87,000 square foot, you end up with, you know, I am a believer in the bigger sites. You know, it's it makes everything work and a hurricane facility just like you said you, you take the traffic you're not <coughs> affected. a buffer like my site for instance has a giant landscape buffer all the way around you cannot see my yard from anywhere there is you know nothing about me too well, we might want to add that to our code you know besides the wall screening that some well, I, do have a, I do have a giant landscape buffer around mine. I'm lucky, you know, in that because, you know, I bought a facility that <coughs> existed. But as long as you're I, here, I'm probably I, going overboard. Yeah, you are. You're we getting, can do that later in the site plan review. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I just have one more question as long as you're still here. And I know that it's it's just for my own information. Yes, ma'am. I would assume that you have requirements in this industry to verify ownership of the materials that you're receiving? Everything, and, and this is what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about Mr. Fusher coming in. Everything that we buy, you, you give a thumbprint, a picture of your ID, Thank a you. picture is taken. If there's any bad stuff going on, you're caught. You know, at this, right now, I own a pawn shop in town, too. I own Warrior Pond down in uh, Roseland. And same thing there. Everything you do is... The pawn shops have a much better name nowadays because, and the same thing with scrapyards, because if you take something to them, you're caught. We have a, we have a national system which the scrapyards are linked to. It's called Leads Online. And everything you buy and stuff like that, they check. They check on everything goes through. We're connected to the sheriff's departments and stuff. On, so it's, it's, it's different than it used to be. <laughs> like, for instance, air conditioners. You can't even, a, a, a public person like you could not walk in and sell me an air conditioner. They actually have to have a license or a letter from an air conditioning company that you had yours replaced. Correct. You know, so there is a lot of, you know, it's a lot different nowadays than it used to be. Thanks for that reassurance. No, no problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so back to my question. And, and I'm sorry. And with that. Are we going to stick to eight feet? If we're going by NAICS standards, the, the screening is an eight foot wall. Mm -hmm. I would I would suggest that um, when we say a site plan meeting all the require requirements of Article uh, 18, that we also include Article 20, appearance, design, and compatibility, because in there it does talk about not necessarily height, but it talks about screening of refuse containers and their location. Thank you. So I believe that we we should probably add that. Now, if you would so like to... Is this going to come back to us for a second review? No, sir. It'll this it'll to go the, to City Council. That's correct. This is a recommend. We're going to recommend to City Council. Yeah. Unless, unless you'd like to table it and bring it back and think about it and make other changes. I mean, that's always, you know, up to you. I'm not the only commissioner here. I was just expressing my... my <laughs> uh, I, did, I did spend some time reviewing this. Before we get to the... Uh, um, 
motion and voting. I just, I just want to say I feel real strongly that it should not be less than five acres. Just so you know that. I do too. You're going to tell me something, aren't you? <laughs> uh, may I? Yes. Uh, the site the applicant actually purchases 4.91 acres, so we would prefer that there's not a five-acre minimum. Um, I think two acres is something that they're willing to agree to. Um, and again, this property is already zoned industrial. It could be any number of things. So have to come through us. It'll, it'll all come through you um, for a site plan, absolutely. I, when he mentioned two acres, I was comfortable with that also. It's just 20,000 square feet. I'm way uncomfortable <laughs> yeah, yeah. with that. So it's so, crazy though, right? Because then maybe you want to give them some direction to go back and modify the industrial, because I think your regular industrial square foot minimums are 15,000 square feet. That, that is pretty low. We were proposing something higher. We're comfortable with two acres. Um, tonight, you are, we are looking for a recommendation so that this can continue moving forward. Um, you're welcome to include in your recommendation any conditions on the approval that you might want the City Commission to look at, like for instance, changing that 20,000 square feet to two acres is something you could include in your motion. Thank you. They, they would include that, but thank you, uh -huh. Rebecca. Are we ready? I, Any more? I have one point of clarification. You, in the, that screening paragraph number seven on the top of page four, uh, in accordance with standards, uh, this is about the screening, in accordance with standards in section 54.3.14.6, that, that's an established code and that is an industrial uh, code for a a border or a screening barrier. <clears throat> Is that a question, Mr. Yes, I'm just, I, I just wanted to make sure that's what it was. I had it circled, but I never looked it up to read what it was all about. Uh, I got to find it again, I'm sorry. I'll be almost there. Yes, screening and buffer yard requirements. Thank you. I knew that's why it was put in there, but I just wanted to make sure. Is that for required screening for abutting residential, non residential uses? So we, we talk a, about the different screening that is required, but again, I would recommend beyond just that ordinance that we do add Article 10. I keep flipping. <coughs> article 10 to to item number one, that the site plan meets all the requirements of Article 18 and Article 10. Okay. What's your pleasure? Let's have a motion. Come on, Mr. Reyes. It's going to be a work in progress. Uh, well, Mr. I, I, I didn't tell yeah. Mr. Carter, you heard what we were saying. <laughs> 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 he follows us so well. <laughs> I'm going to have a hard time with this if I try to do it. So really the only changes we're doing is the area. And we want to add article temp to item one. Did you want to address setbacks adjacent to residential districts? Right now it's at 50. It's going once, it's going twice. No. Because the lot size is going to take care of that. Take a stab at a motion. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we approve, that we recommend to the City Council Code of Ordinance and Land Development Code Amendments, known as Ordinance Number 0 19 07, with the following changes. <coughs> We'd like to change the area of this 
This is item six, section one, to minimum lot size, two acres. We would also like to add article 10 to item one. I believe I covered it there. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we'll take a voice vote. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need more discussion, do we? Okay, we'll take a voice vote, please. Uh, make roll call by name. Mr. Eugen. Yes. Mr. Kizzelbosch. Yes. Ms. Cottenberg. Yes. Mr. Roth. Yes. Mr. Motti. Yes. Mr. Alvarez. Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. I made the motion. <laughs> Mr. Carter? Yes. It is unanimous. Thank you. And thank you for helping us to understand. Thank you. Thank business. you so much. Good luck. We could have done it without you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. We have no. Uh, unfinished business. Do we have any input from the public? Seeing none. No new business. Commissioners matters. Mr. Carter. Okay. For me tonight. Okay. No. Nothing. No. Nothing. Nothing. I would like to recommend to the city to uh, provide uh, shirts like we received in the past. Um, I've now worn mine 10 years and it's um, showing pretty tough signs of wear. I can and, show you uh, mine. I've never it's worn it. Uh, just, just for passing it on to the city as a recommendation, it's not anything more than that, but just I think it's it's a nice gesture because when we come to the commission meetings, uh, I think the guy should wear it and I'll leave it, go with that. Thank you, Stephanie. Need a new shirt, sir. Give him a shirt, give him a shirt. The, uh, the agenda packet was delivered by the mailman oddly to my front doorstep. That was really odd awesome. this time. Right. That was just- Plenty of time to review. Yeah, that was really awesome. Um, and, you, and you may think th thank the male person, yeah. <laughs> Michelle Faulkner, who's, who's our staff, and I think it, it works a lot better now. Yeah, thank you. You're is welcome. Is Dory uh, still on vacation? Is she coming back? She, well, let's all hope so, okay? <laughs> <laughs> let's God. say fervent prayers that yes, she does. Yes, she still is on vacation and enjoying some much needed time off, and she'll be right. back on Tuesday afternoon. Do you have any feedback on the, the drainage swales, the large ones that are not getting mowed by this? Oh, by Mr. The Reyes, you did ask that the last meeting. I so apologize. I, I'll make another note. I'm, I'm sorry. I, you can I will go back for years. You're going to see it. I've been asking that for years. <laughs> it would be better if you sent me an email, and then I would. I always address my email. So, but I, I'll try. Then I got to email everybody. No, just me, just me, and then I can reply to everybody. Thank you. Al, anything? No. I, 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 I would like to add two more, if I may, please. I'm just curious, because we've got that derelict building setting on US-1 that we approved a plan for where AT&T is going and nothing is happening, both that and the Verizon building across the street. Any idea where, where the developers stand on that with regard to starting something? Yes, AT&T is moving forward. They are pulling some permits at this point with the building department and they've got some nice designs in and you should be seeing some movement hopefully fairly Demolition. soon. Demolition. Yes, hopefully fairly soon. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just, that, that's really sad looking. But, and I know the story behind it, but that's okay. why I was hoping they were getting close to starting it. And what about Verizon? We the haven't project? heard anything very, mm -hmm. we have not heard any movement at, at this okay. point. That building looks okay at this point. I do have 
something that I'm going to bring up. Um, I made a point of speaking with staff last week. I would, um, I'd like to assign some homework for all of us. We're going to be working on uh, the new comp plan again. Um, and each year since I have lived in Sebastian, with each comp plan, there has been a stipulation that we have way less affordable housing than we need for this city. That will, I am absolutely certain, be a determination again. Um, I remember at our last meeting, I asked for what the average wage of a city of Sebastian employee was, and um, I was provided with that information. It is uh, $15.85 per hour. That's the average wage, okay? And I wanna tell you, because I'm sure that many of you do not know this, on the day that I ran a scan, the lowest rental property, the lowest rental property was $1,450 per month, which equals um, about 41% of the gross wage. That's not livable. If a new person, a young person, comes to the city of Sebastian and gets a job and wants to live someplace in the area, um, if they were to choose to purchase a property, um, the, and a lot of people are not, available, are not aware of this, our average sale price in the city of Sebastian is $213.107. Two hundred thirteen thousand. Two hundred thirteen thousand one hundred and seven. Yeah. Okay. It, in order to have a monthly payment of twelve hundred and twelve dollars per month, which represents forty four percent of that gross income, that person would end up um, having to have saved up forty two thousand six hundred dollars for a down payment. Closing costs on a loan, most of you aren't aware, is close to another eight to ten thousand dollars. Okay. The reason that I bring this up is because uh, I've been in the housing industry a very long time. Affordable housing keeps a city viable. As we retire, and we've been saying, "Oh, we're a wonderful retirement community," and that's great. But all of us retired folks need services and we want services. And if we want our services to be affordable, the people who provide them need to be able to live close to where their work is, otherwise the prices skyrocket. Or the employers train an employee and then lose the employee. So you end up with substandard services because <clears throat> there is a constant training going on. When we think about how do we provide affordable housing in our community, and, I'm, and it's not just young people, it's people like me who may give up my big house. And because uh, looking forward just a few years, I'm thinking who's going to take care of all this? How can I afford that? Um, and where will I live if I don't live in my big house? If I want to stay living here, it's an issue. Um, when <coughs> retirees come to our community, they, most of them, uh, and I think that Al could probably verify that, we have a high amount of properties that are sold here with no financing involved. They're cash transactions. Because many, many retirees bring along with them a lot of equity from other places. That drives the prices up and further cuts out the people who need affordable properties. In order to provide affordable properties, there are several different ways that it can happen. One of them, which is, I'm going to use that word again, odious <coughs> to me, is um, subsidized housing. I don't like it. Um, it tends to be housing that is oftentimes set aside from 
normal neighborhoods. Um, it discourages that will to save up and provide your own equity and earn equity, and it's just, it's most oftentimes not a real good thing, and you might wonder why I, I'm saying these things, but I have been involved with housing for the last 50 years, and I've worked with um, government agencies, quasi-government and private agencies um, to help revitalize neighborhoods and things, and I, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I think that we all need to start thinking about more creative ways of putting together places that people can, respectable, decent places that people can live in our community and we don't have to pay them a fortune. They'll be able to live here. I, um, I went online, at, Lisa showed me some material that was really interesting, I went online and I, I encourage all of you to go to AARP and for those of you who don't know, that's for old people. <laughs> I'm sure you don't know anything about I it. I just heard about it. I'm not a member. I just heard yeah. about it. But if you go online and you look at their site, they have some wonderful publications that are free. And they talk about keeping communities vital and keeping housing affordable in a community. Um, and I, nobody likes change, but I, I know because of where I've been. And, uh, and because of the experiences that I've had, that if we don't do something about this now, it's only going to get worse. It is not going to get better um, because prices will continue to escalate. And the only alternative, if we don't do something more creative, is to provide higher and higher wages, which will cost all of us more and more money. Um, and I'm getting to a point in my life where I'm thinking that perhaps my income will become less and less instead of more and more. Okay. So it concerns me, and I, and I want our community to stay viable. I want to see young people, not just old people. I want to see people who are striving to um, enjoy the community and enjoy the life here and build a life and raise their children here and, um, and keep, keep us emotionally and physically healthy. So I'd like you to think about some of those alternatives. Probably it will involve um, doing something with density. And I, I, use, I use this example. My favorite aunt and uncle owned a bakery in a city, and they lived above their bakery for 35 years. <clears throat> well, we've approved the entire, stuff like that here. The entire street was filled mm -hmm. with people and who lived forward, above the bakery. Right. But that, in, that increases the density on a site when we mm -hmm. do things like that. And I think when, from what I see, we, we have some <clears throat> density issues that could be solved as opposed to um, subsidizing buyers or subsidizing builders. We need to, the reality of it is the, um, the land cost per unit needs to be lower so that that house, that housing unit can be lower priced. And I, and I think you're all bright, intelligent people and, and I'd like you to just put your minds to work and see if you can come up with some great ideas. And that's what I have to say this way. I want to ask, um, the spirit of Sebastian, then we have some pods in there that we're going to be affordable housing. Is that moving forward, actually? <laughs> <laughs> um, they do have, they've reconfigured their preliminary plat. Uh, we do have that on our docket okay. uh, to look at. Um, because of the cost of construction and the cost of land, I mean, they have reduced their scope for the immediate future, for the first pod, if you will. Um, as far as affordable housing, they were they never said affordable housing, but they did say um, a multi-family. Yeah, that's one of the pods right. was going to be duplexes, I believe. Okay. Whether that materializes sometime in the future, I I don't want to speculate right now. We're just looking at pod one and two, I think, the which other is single-family homes. A little about, and you brought it to us. It's the no tiny home community. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention that. I haven't heard it in, for a while, uh, but it was brought up many years ago, mooring sites. Uh, 
along the waterway so that oh. people can uh, pay rent. Live in the water? <laughs> Live on the water. Cheap income. Or, you know, you, there, there is many areas for mooring sites. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the past commissioner brought it up. Well, I worked on a mooring field site up in Cocoa, okay. if you're familiar with their waterfront up there. Um, and it's there's a lot of facilities that need to be built in okay. order to support the mooring field, as they call it. And it, it can be kind of expensive. I mean, you right, need to have a pump. Out there no, and I, I appreciate that. So. The kind of out of the box thinking, I, I think that's going to get us to where we want to be. And I'm only saying that it's, you know, you have to have a pump out facility, you have to have restrooms and laundry yeah. mat, all that good stuff. Mm. We can do it. <laughs> but I'm just saying that that, that comes with it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure if you know it, but when the, uh, the development that got built across the street from the post office, when it first came in, it was presented. It was supposed to be. It was uh, presented as affordable, and this week a two-bedroom, two-bath home on a teeny tiny lot is $291,000. Yes. And I personally. It's not affordable. I kind of like that because it's driving my house prices. Yeah, that is a problem. <laughs> teeny tiny lots aren't a problem. I believe they are. No, they're not uh, a problem me, as, as long as it's affordable. <laughs> if, if they're affordable, but what you see is a type of development, such a tight cluster, it's not appealing. No, it's not appealing to you, but it's appealing to me. It's appealing to you. Purchase. It's appealing to a lot of people who yeah. have gotten to the point where I don't want to... I don't want to pay for somebody to mow my acre and a half anymore. I don't have the physical ability to do it myself, and I'm not alone. But I still want to live in a respectable community. So I would like us to not judge so much the lot size as we judge or think about how do we provide some housing that is affordable for the people who work here, the teachers, the police officers, mm -hmm. the people who work in our parks and rec department, the people who take care of our streets, all of our city employees. How do we keep our young people who graduate from college with a wonderful degree and find out that they can't afford to come back home and live there? It's a, well, it's we're going to... I'm sorry. Market. Here's a problem that I'm seeing. You have a lot of young children with college degrees job market. I'm not talking about the job market. I'm talking about, okay, I have a specific example of um, a friend who had a, her daughter's cousin moved down here, got a job. She's living with her cousin six months. Cousin says, you know, it's time for you to find a place of your own now. You got you started here. You got yourself a job. You know, you've, you've passed that induction period. And so she goes out and she's going to look for a place to live and cannot find anything affordable. She will quit her job and she will go back to where she came from. And, you know, she has, she's a, a young, skillful person who had talents to bring to a job and the employer spent a good deal of time training her, but she's got to go. She can't afford to live so here. if if I may, I'm sorry. We we we. I don't want us to get too d yeah. further down this no, rabbit I'm hole. Sorry. And us staff want to make sure that you, the commission, get educated on a lot of data and information that's out there as we move towards updating our comprehensive plan. So the livable communities with AARP, if you go online, livable communities on the AARP website, um, they've got a lot of great free documents and they don't just address housing but they address mobility and they address open space and they they ad address a lot of the elements that we'll be having to ad to to look at and and to determine what we want for our community um, but staff itself is already putting on the calendar in conjunction with your regularly scheduled meetings different workshops 
and we'll bring in, you know, stakeholders who are, are you know, enjoined in those type of, of uh, uh, subjects, if you will, to, to help us make the correct decisions. So I, I want you to know that we're, we're not just gonna throw something at you and say, <laughs> solve the affordable housing problem here in, in, well, the United States, but here in Sebastian. We're gonna take our time and make sure that we're all educated and can make educated decisions. And I, I want you to feel comfortable with that. I, it's, it's gonna be a struggle and it's gonna be a lot of work on my staff's side, but we're, we're gonna get through this. And I, 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 I'm very excited about having all of you as my partners because really we're, we're, we're a good set of intelligent, hardworking people here who really care about our community. And I, I, I think we're gonna end up at the end of the day with a really nice uh, development plan. So I look that, forward to the workshops. I think that's a great idea. Yes. We've had them before and it works well. Thank you. Absolutely. I have one question. Where are we going with the vacation rentals? Has there been an increase in that? Um, you know, it's interesting is that I'm, I'm not sure. We're not really tracking to see what we had before or what we have today because we didn't have a base <laughs> to start with. We just had a lot of complaints, and then we set the registration program into place, and a lot of individuals have come in and registered their homes. Um, those that, <clears throat> excuse me, we receive complaints from, code enforcement gets a hold of them, and they typically get right in line and, and um, comply. We have a nice, healthy stock, but I don't, I don't think we have that I mean, an overwhelming amount. Um, if you'd like that number, I'd have to call it Michelle. Michelle always keeps track of all of the vacation okay. rentals in the city. I was just wondering where we were going with that, if it was increasing, decreasing. Uh... I, yeah, again, I, I, I mean, the only thing I can say to you is it's increasing only because we're getting them registered, but they could have been in existence beforehand and we would not have known Don't that. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, okay, thank you. But we have a registration going now, which is important. Exactly correct. Thank you. Exactly correct. Any other additional staff matters? Attorney matters? Meeting adjourned. Thank you all.